have folks that will always be making statements about the Bible, like, oh, it's not real, or, oh, it's a book of lies, or folly, or fairy tale, so on and so on. And the thing that amazes me is that you have a lot of these really um, so-called, from a worldly perspective, they're intelligent folks. They really are intelligent folks in, in their profession, in their trade. They may be scientists, they may be doctors or lawyers, so they know all this complex legal mumbo-jumbo and jargon, but they can't figure out the Bible, you know, Old Testament or New Testament. That they are um, scientists, they're technical people. They know all this technical stuff, but they still can't figure out the scriptures. You know, they know how to read into Shakespeare and into poetry and can interpret all kind of sort of stuff, but still... They don't understand the Bible. And then there's a few people, a few individuals, and we have a couple of videos, I think, and there's videos out there where certain folks who admit that they didn't believe in the Bible because they were believing all the lies and the hype that has been put out um, in the world in counterfeit Christianity. So they didn't believe it for themselves until they started to really study the Word. Like there's a lawyer guy, a white guy who's a lawyer, and his video is out there. Forget the name of it. But I think we have it maybe in our personal archive. And now that was mentioned, we'll probably try to bring it forward so people can check it out for themselves. But anyway, he was talking about how he didn't believe in the Bible, that the story couldn't be true. He just believed that it could not, this, the biblical um, testimony could not be the truth. So I think a friend or his wife, I think it was his wife, his story is that his wife, who was a Christian, who was a believer, as they say, she challenged him. She said, go and, 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 and put it to the test. In other words, in your own discipline, I think he was a lawyer or something like that, you know, as well as some, you know, being a lawyer, he went to college, so forth and so on. So he's a pretty so-called smart guy. So use the same, the same discipline and criteria that you would in your profession and put the biblical testimony and account to the test. And guess what? He did so. And the interesting thing that he found out, and this is what, what his video, um, I think he was, it's called Making the Case for Christ, or it was on the Cross TV, one of the Cross TV um, um, biblical uh, programs. And um, he found out that there's more evidence, actually, for the Bible account than there is for the classical works of of Greco-Roman and hence European history. In other words, all these classics that we know, Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey and uh, uh, different, um, what would they call them, historians and Plato and stuff like that, that, there are more documents both in the language, the European language, and in other versions from other parts of the world of ancient,cy than for the classical works of European, um, Greco-Roman, Western, classical, what they call the classics, the classic European works. And he, he, in one of the, in one of the demonstration of PowerPoint that he used, he showed the number of scriptures that there were for things like Plato and Aristotle and, 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 and the classical Homer and Iliad and so forth and so on. And then he showed for the different books in the Bible. You know, and, and when you see the mountain, it's like the stuff of the Bible is like the so-called towers. It was like it was like skyscrapers, and the ones for the classical works were like, um, you know, one story. These kind of one story kind of buildings. You know, like one story flat houses, more or less, like huts. It was like a little hut compared to a skyscraper. So there's more proof, and there's more proof for the biblical account than there is for the Greco-Roman and the European classics. And, and I think that is a very, very important point when people talk about well, the proof, that whether the Bible is, is, is real or not, or it, it can't be authenticated, because some people believe that it's just the European kind of um, version. And with the, some, some, there's some blacks out there, and, and there's some lecturers that actually have made the false um, assertion, but then they, they never read no Ethiopic or Goethe's, and they don't really know about the Afrocentric root of Christianity.
Christianity, because they do, they'll recognize that it came out of the whole Afro-Shemitic world, the African and the Shemitic, or the East African and Middle Eastern world. And Ethiopia, historically, and, and the documentation, that is, is, is now a universal kind of heritage. We hear about Ethiopia selling the Ark of the Covenant, you know, or at least this is the allegation, could be propaganda, so forth and so on. But we're not letting our heart be troubled about that, you know, and not being afraid about that. Because that's the testimony is already there. Everything that we have taken pride in, if you know this, we say, oh, Ethiopia has the Ark of the Covenant. Now the New World Order, secret society, the evildoers, now they're trying to take this so-called from us. But they can't take from us what is our own. Because this is a whole new day. This is a whole new time. But here's, while we said all of that, was to kind of get into this point right here about the, the fact that reading and reading comprehension is so very, very important. Reading and reading comprehension. Because, you, you, you know, we've spoken to a lot of different brothers and sisters over the years, and most of them say, like even ourselves have to admit, and we want to admit this, that there were some parts of the Bible that we we were uncomfortable with, you know, the certain areas of Scripture. For example, the whole turn the other cheek, you know, the part in the Bible that says turn the other cheek, so forth and so on. And, and that part, we didn't wrestle with it, but we were not very comfortable with it, you know, turn the other cheek. You mean that if, um, like back in the civil rights in America, that when the racist and evil white man, those who were doing evil acts of aggression against, against um, peaceful black people, were lynching them and killing them and crucifying them, that the black folks should just turn the other cheek to. Somehow we were more of the opinion that the black people should have, should have, should have fought back, you, you know, should, should fight for their own. But of course when you do that in this racist paradigm, they blame the victim, you know, victimizing the so-called victim. And there's a little word that we want to make on this particular um, DVD right here. This one right here, I don't know if you've seen it before, this YouTube one about Haiti and the whole harp thing. At the end of it is some very disturbing, some very disturbing things about some so-called Jewish or European people. Not what ones are alleging they might have done, but more from the reaction of those to those who have put out it's possible that these are allegations that have been circulating about body parts and Haiti and so forth and so on. This is another point we want to touch on this um, in, another, in another section and everything. But the whole turn the other cheek thing, that bothered us too. We, we, we were a little bit, you know, it was like turn the other cheek. You mean if, 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 if the, what Christ was telling his disciples, the Hebrews, the black Hebrew Israelites, that if the white European Romans slapped them side the head and beat them and did all these kind of racist and racial acts of aggression, was Christ saying to the black Hebrew Israelites of the New Testament time that they should turn the other cheek? See, this is how it has been put forward. Then I began to think, I said, I said, I said, I said, wait, suppose the devil Satan and the evildoers insert themselves, infiltrate themselves into the Christian ministry and, and, and go forward as um, transforms himself. You know, suppose the devil transforms himself to be a, a minister of the light of righteousness of, of the Christian gospel and then he teaches people just turn the other cheek to all this wicked acts of violence and then oh man that's what's happened. That's exactly what has gone on. In other words, this is a falsifying because people don't understand the context. This is what this particular message is about. It's about the context of Scripture, and then we're going to try to dovetail this in to some discussion of some of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church materials concerning the Sadistu Kalata uh, Wengel, uh, or the, what, they, what they call the six words of the gospel as well as um, what has appeared in a lot of these um, mini kitab, these Ethiopian kitabo trade here. This is one right here on the Fidel where they have near the back 
um, let's show you the page right here. That page right there is Yeg, is Yabi here, the Hik. So this is uh, a truncating. This is this is the law of God truncated. And then down there at the bottom right there is the Sadistu Kalata Wen Gale. And we want to just um, address this particular subject matter and issue. And you'll find it on other of the Ethiopian, um, um, I call them the mini prayer books, the Dharasana, to the Kitab, the Kitaboj, or some will call it um, the mini books, the Tinisha, Met Ahift, Met Hafoch. And usually you'll find like on the back, like this one right here, you'll see it on the back of this one as well. And then down here, the Sadistu um, Alata Wengel. And then you also find it uh, in some of the books near near the back of some of the books. But And also inside some of these books, these um, some are called like catechisms. Some of these serve the role of catechisms in Ethiopia. Um, as you have to recall, the Bible, the Bible fully, was printed. Remember what Revelation says in Revelation 5, 5, that no one could even look upon those ancient scrolls because the knowledge of that good is an ancient language was lost except among some of the higher clergy and other ones because many were able to read it but not were not able to um, fully articulate, articulate, you know, the real meaning nor able to translate it able to translate. Now, Matthew fulfills that, Revelation 5.5. 5. And there's many points of correspondence and reference and revelation to that. And we've, we've, we've touched on that in some of the other and the related, and the related videos. So, if you want to get into the Metaf Edus or the Amharic Bible of His Majesty, but of course, the caution and the warning remains, remains front and center that there's another Bible. In fact, they've discontinued the Keyless Ethiopians and the apostate clergy has discontinued you use their their authority since they sit in Moses' seat, so to speak. They have discontinued the 1961-62 Metzoth Caduce of His Imperial Majesty, the Book of the Seven Seals. And we know, and we've been telling ones and ones that though we it is for us to proclaim this. At the same time, we knew that once the word got out there, you, you know, and once people started to recognize this half of the story, that it would become more difficult, you understand, to obtain copies of this. And we saw them gradually reducing the printing, and it was getting harder and harder over the years to obtain the Met of Caduce or His Majesty's Bible. But thankfully, hallelujah, this has been digitalized now. Now it's been, I think, Dirk Rockman or Brockman, um, ones like um, 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 Lapsley with good books has also gone forward to um, scan things, PDF. So it's there. It's basically now up to us to do what we have to do and, and, to, and to reproduce this particular book. But it's significant that now the, the testimony is being testified exactly who these are and why Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 12 is there, speaking about the Ethiopians and the careless Ethiopians. But what does this turn the other cheek? This is what we're going to want to touch on right here. These are some of the themes that often it's important to associate the reason why this is important and how this is connected with that. Turn the other cheek. Let's go to that portion in the Bible, and this kind of dovetails into, you know, should we turn the other cheek? You understand to to our one, the one who is not our brother. This is the question: Should we turn the other cheek to the one who is not our brother? In other words, to the racist, you know, to the to the so-called white supremacists, to the neo-Nazi, you know, who wanna who wanna castrate us and kill us, or maybe kill us and castrate us, or castrate us, kill us, and then castrate us some more, you know, because he's afraid of the black seed. He's afraid of that race, you know, the seed, the race of the house of Israel, the Beit Israel. Now, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, at verse uh, 39, 
right? In Matthew chapter chapter five, we're gonna go through the whole chapter, but let's just go to chapter five, verse thirty nine. It says, But I say to you that ye resist not evil, right? But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now I've heard a couple of preachers who um I'll call them black liberation preachers, who have interpreted this not going to the original Ethiopic or the Gutas or the Royal Amharic or even the Hebrew or at least the Septuagint Greek Bible, have looked at it and spiritually said, well, what it really means is not just turn the other cheek, but turn to him the other cheek, you know, Krav Magad, Krav Wuga. You know, turn to him the other cheek. That's what it is. In other words, he slaps your cheek, you turn, you know, you return it to his other cheek is, is how some have interpreted And when I heard that, I said, okay, it probably means that. But then as I got into the good is and, and, and the and the Amharic, you could say that, but it's not really how it's being interpreted correctly. So that was one of the areas of scripture. I, I meet a lot of brothers and sisters and I've met a lot um, in the past, and, and most of them, they've had a problem with that. The gospel, the good news, the connection of we black people being the Hebrew Israelites and the evidence and the facts of it and the connection with Ethiopia. Most of those parts, ones and ones, our brothers and sisters, when they see the mountain and the overwhelming evidence, they get those parts. You know, that part, but like, wow, this part needs to be taught. That's clear. Give thanks. You need to put it out in the book, so forth and so on. So the part that they don't get, is uh, oh wait this this, this 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 turn the other cheek business? What was Christ really saying for us to be a doormat to the evil doers? Is, is that what Christ is saying? That that on a certain level would even seem to be unjust. One would say that's being unjust. Now this is what we've been saying. Many people know how to read, but not many people have reading comprehension. You know, many people can read something. For example, even in the earlier days or, or, or years ago, I could read good is a little bit, you know what I mean? Amharic. And you want to improve that reading good is and reading Amharic. It's not that I understood everything I read. I, I saw the Fidel. I knew what sound the Fidel was. I could articulate it fairly correctly. Some things better than other things. You know, practice makes perfect. But it's not that I understood exactly the context you know like if you read Shakespeare for example if you read Shakespeare you could read it but you may not even understand the context of it so even that right there is a whole discipline this is one of the reasons why we say that for the English speakers the King James Bible is the best version of the Bible like for them hard speakers the Metaf Kedus of Ketamari Hala Selassie or the Revised Amharic Bible, it is the best um, Amharic Bible. When, when you understand the Ge'ez, the Septuagint, and the, and the Masoretic, the, the Hebrew, you put it into context. But some people say, well, we need to make it Kella. Uh, you know, in other words, they say that we need, to, we need to dumb it down. I mean, you have this right here. This is from another lecture anyway. Um, we need to, but you don't have to. No, you don't have to. In the same way Shakespeare. Imagine if you take Shakespeare, right? Take Shakespeare and take it out of the context, right? Take it out of that particular context of language. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it still be the same thing? Wouldn't it? You see, a lot of folks about Shakespeare, they wouldn't want, let's translate Shakespeare and dumb it down into modern English. Instead of Shakespeare saying thou and thee, let him say, yo, 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 man. I mean, you could do that. It could be a Shakespeare-esque something, escapade, you know, escaping from the old traditional language because you want to explain this, get younger folks into Shakespeare. But even they themselves, after they, after they get that part, they want to see the original. You understand? They, they want to see the more authentic. So when people try to make these excuses and say, yes, you're right. You know, some of the KLC them, you are right about the Amharic. It's very good, but a lot of people cannot understand it. So why don't you teach them? Imagine the English folks saying, 
with their classical English works of literature, you know what, let's destroy that. Let's take that away. And let's give people some nowadays, yo, man, what's going on? You know, instead of how art thou, where cometh thou from? Yo, man, where you going? Where you coming from? What it be like? People would, would say you are defiling our culture. This is the very same point we are saying to you are defiling our culture. Should we turn the other cheek to that? But now, here's the whole point about this right here. And here's what you have to understand. Or what you should understand. We have to understand this. When we look at... Um, when we look at... Okay, this this cap for this right here. Anyway, when we look at when we look at um, the parables of Christ, we have to understand the context. See, there's something known as let's just talk about this right here. Let's put this uh, turn the other cheek. All right, that is Matthew, Matthew 5 and 39, right? Then we want to put, there is reading, right? And then there is reading comprehension. Now, some people have an apprehension about reading and an apprehension about reading comprehension. Or we can call this in parentheses understanding. And understanding what is read. Understanding. So there's reading, and there is us understanding what is read. So many can read, but many do not understand what they are reading. How do we know this? Do you recall? Let's look at the New Testament. We're still here in Matthew 5 and 39. Matthew 5 and 39. We're going to try to go through this at a lively pace. But let's go to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. You remember what happens in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8? Some of you have been studying. You know what Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8 is about. It's the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip. Philip and the real Ethiopian. This is a real Ethiopian Hebrew. A real Ethiopian. Not careless, but a real Ethiopian. That means we have to be able to distinguish between holy Ethiopians and profane Ethiopians between good black folks and bad black folks, uh, in other words. But, um, and you, just because you're black does not mean you're my brother. I know a lot of you love Peter Tosh, man. I love the brother Peter Tosh, but he made some critical errors, you see. And hopefully his life would not be in vain if we can learn from it. You know what I'm saying? And learn from that. Perhaps he didn't know these things. Perhaps he didn't have an opportunity. It's, it's a struggle, my brothers and sisters. But we have to... Um, capitalize and consolidate the gains of our ancestors. So even with Marcus Garvey, when we're talking about what well, Marcus Garvey wasn't the first to say, he says blasphemy, some of y'all getting upset. You see, we're not going to turn the other cheek to y'all because y'all not being very brotherly. You see, because the whole act, act of um, turning the other cheek, this is all based on one key word. This is all based, everything that Christ is telling us here is based on one key word, and that is brotherhood. That's brotherhood. Now, how do we know this? Brotherhood, or what we would call the when de ma match. We could go ma match chinette, if you want to put it in an adjectival, in an adjectival form. So we have the Wenda Mamachinet, or Wenda Mamach, which is brotherhood. He's speaking in terms of brotherhood. Now, how, how do we know it? Because we're reading this, and we're comprehending what we're reading. So when Christ spoke to the disciples, he was speaking to those who became his disciples. You understand? Those who came to him. Because remember, it's all based on, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have life eternal or everlasting life. 
Now remember, we have to read it and we have to comprehend what we're reading. That God so loved the world, he loved the world enough to give his only begotten son, to, to give his black boy, the baby Jesus, Yeshua, to the world. That whosoever believe or, or better comprehend, admit on him should not what perish, should not perish. So let's just do a little logic. This is how logic works, the root, the root, the fundamentals of logic. That means if he gave his only begotten, he so loved the world to give his only begotten son that whosoever should, should believe, let's update that word, be lie, Eve, whoever should admit my men, have our main on him, should not what perish, but have life eternal. That means that if one does not admit on him, then what happens? They're effed. They're effed. They perish. Basically, they're effed. You know, I, I, I say it that way so some of the younger brothers and sisters who are coming out of the street life and the rest of that, they can understand what we're talking about. When we say, man, that's fucked. You understand? If you're not, you know, to perish, to be cursed is to be effed up. Plain and simple, to be effed up. See, that's how the younger folks can understand it, you see, because unless you're able, so we are not changing what the Bible says, but we are giving now a key uh, uh, interpretation to that. So when now when they look at curse, they get it, you see, because they've been taught curse in the same way they've been taught this out of context, to turn the other cheek. Christ was speaking about turn the other cheek to our brothers, turn the other cheek to our sisters and to our mothers and to those who are of the household of faith. Proof is when Christ says in his prayer to the Father in, in the Gospel of John, he says, um, I pray for these, I don't pray for the world. He said he's not praying for the world. So we've been taught and told a false or a counterfeit gospel. So what does this turn the other cheek mean? Here we go, we're in Acts of the Apostles. This goes to Acts of the Apostles. Um, Chapter 8, verse 30. Chapter 8, verse 30. And Philip, Philippos, he ran thither, thither means there, to him, and heard him read the prophet Esaias. Esaias is the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, or in the Hebrew, Yeshayahu, or Bamarinya, Esaias. So he heard him read the Nabi named Esaias and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Understand that. So Philip listened to the Holy Spirit, and he ran, and he caught up to this chariot. Man, black, and see, we know he's black even because of that right there. He could run. He's African, that African gene. He ran. In a sense, he almost ran up to and could have overtaken the chariot. Wow. You know, talking about, talking about athletic. Um, so Philip ran thither to him, and he heard. He heard the Ethiopian eunuch reading the prophet Esaias. Now, this Ethiopian eunuch, let's qualify this. This Ethiopian eunuch was a Hebrew, was a Hebrew. So this proves that there were Ethiopian Hebrews in that time because he wasn't reading a comic book. He wasn't reading some love romance novel or some, some garbage magazine or some, some Roman dogma or some decree or something like that. He was reading the prophet Esaias. He was reading the prophet Esaias. Now, what else it says right here? And so Philip asks the Ethiopian eunuch, he says, Understandest thou, do you comprehend, do you understand what you are reading? See, this is the problem that many of us can remember at one time for a black man to read it was a crime. You see, so we, we know they're very upset now, you know, but a lot of you are not using that ability. See, now many of you all can read, but you're not seeking to understand, to comprehend what you are reading. But here's what the Ethiopian eunuch said. He said in verse 31, how can I? He was humble. He, he showed, of course, he probably had a comprehension to some degree. You know, he understood this word meant that and that word. And what was he reading in? Was he reading in, in Gutters? Was he reading it in, 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 in Hebrew? Let's just say he was reading in Hebrew. He understood what he was reading, but in humility, he says, How can I accept some man should guide me? 
except some man should guide me. And he desired that Philip would come up and sit with him. So then this goes into the place of the scripture that um, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading. So let's get back to this right here about turn the other cheek. Because the point that we wanted to make is that because one can read, that's good. That's the first level, reading. But the next level is comprehension. Do you comprehend? Do you understand? Can you give an intelligent commentary or explanation of what you were reading? You see, like I mentioned this before, and I'll mention it once again here. One of my favorite, one of my favorite um, classes in school or subject matters was actually, you know, reading comprehension. You know, that exercise that they would give us in school where we had to read a particular passage and they would have those questions where you have to answer some stuff about it. And to me, that was the easiest part of the test. That's why I liked it. It was the easiest part. But for a lot of students, it, it was difficult. And what they would do is look at the, 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 the answers, you know, or the possible answers. And they would choose the one they like, but not the one that reflected what was in the story. But now as I get a little bit older, right, and hopefully y'all will and wiser, I begin to see a lot of grown folks be doing the same thing. And a lot of people be doing the same thing with their faith, is that they, they choose what they like to think, pretend to themselves and fool themselves that it says, instead of really trying to comprehend what's the, you know, the key word we love is context. What is the context? So it's the comprehension that gives us right here the, the context. And put an asterisk right there, context. You understand what goes along with calling with the text, not against the text, but what goes along with the text. What's, what's to mess our sign with the text? So when we go back to, um, or go forward rather, to Matthew chapter Five. We have to ask a couple of questions. We have to ask ourselves a couple of questions. You, you know those questions that one has to ask. What do you think those questions are? What do you think those questions are? Those questions are the the who, the what, the where, the why, the how. We got to ask ourselves a couple of questions about 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 this. All right? We have to ask ourselves a couple of questions about this. First question is, who is this? Who is he speaking to? Who is, who is he speaking to? Who is the Moshiach? Who is our black Lord, Miss Ghana? Who is our black Lord and Savior? Who is our black Lord and Savior speaking to? So we don't put this word here because we want you to understand this. This is the, the Nibab. All right, the nibab, right? Nibab will be the, the reading. This is equal reading right here, the nibab. All right, the nibab according to the reading. So who is Christ speaking to in Matthew chapter 5? Is Christ speaking to the European, the white Romans there? Now, I know a lot of folks are going to say there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Well, of course, if the, if the Jew, the black, is truly thinking according to Christ, if the Gentile, the white, is truly thinking according to Christ and conforming according to Christ, then in Christ's sight, they are one. They are as brothers. Okay? So, so let's not go there right now. A lot of folks like to get there instead of, first of all, this is before, you know what I'm saying, this is before the Hebrews or the Jews rejected Jesus, before they rejected him as Moshiach and king. You know what I'm saying? And this is before they say he turned to the Gentiles or turned to the diaspora, because there was already a diaspora in other countries besides in Palestine. So you have to understand the big picture, the big context to it. But here in Matthew chapter 5, it says, And seeing the multitudes, so were there Romans here and white, maybe a couple of Romans, you know, they see black folks getting together, they want to know, like, what's going on you know, as it were. So this is not to exclude others, but to first of all point to exactly who was he speaking to. 
You know what I'm saying? He was speaking to those who would be his disciples, and Christ qualifies it in the scripture by the key word of brother. Brother, and we extend this to brotherhood. He is speaking to those who are in him and who accept him as Moshiach because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the Bain Ha Elohim, that whosoever should ma men should exercise true and faithful witness, admit in him, should not perish, but have life eternal. So that, see, there's, there's people say that in God, in God, and in Jesus, there is like um, He's unconditional. No, 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 no. Stop lying like that. You're gonna hurt your soul. You're gonna hurt yourself. There are conditions. See, the conditions that we have to admit, my men, or in bad translation, believe. You understand? We have to believe, which means my men to admit. You understand? Exercise true and faithful witness as the Amen in him. You understand? He is the Amen subjectively, and we must have Imnet. And the Imnet is as the bride of the Amen. We'll get into that um, a little bit in another, in another lecture. But here, Christ, we have the Beatitudes. This is what you call the Sermon on the Mount. Then at verse uh, 17, the relation of the Moshiach to the law or the relationship of Christ to Torah. So Christ is given his relationship to Torah because many folks, um, churchins, you know, you know what a churchin is, right? A churchin is somebody who go to church. They pretend that they are Christian. You know, but they basically, the only thing they really do halfway faithfully is go to church every Sunday. But to really know what is contained in the testimony of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they really don't know. Not saying that they are perfect people, they don't have no flaw or whatever, but they don't they have not even applied themselves to reading and comprehending what is here in his word. You see, so that's a that's a basic idea of a church. Now you have nominal Christians. Nominal mean that they have the nomos. Nomos mean name. They they have the name of Christian or they name themselves as Christian. Um then you have the Baptists. To me, they're kind of a little confused because John, do they follow John or Yeshua is the question I have. You see what happened to John, right, the Baptist. He lost his head, and a lot of these guys have done, it, done the same thing too. But anyway, Christ says right here in the relation of Christ to the Torah, he says, think not that I am come to destroy the law. He said, don't think that I've come to destroy Torah. You see? But this is how a lot of Christians teach it today, that there's no Torah, forget about the Old Testament. Oh, that's old, I'm in the New Testament, I'm not in the Old Testament. Like they know about it, but they don't know Jack, they don't know Jacob, they don't know Yaakov. Or the prophets, the prophets is the second of those books, the Nabim or Nabiya. He says, I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. He is not coming to destroy, but to complete it, to perfect it, to fulfill it. He's coming as the completion or the fulfillment. Now, the fulfillment doesn't mean that everything before is gone. It doesn't mean anything. That's what a lot of people teach you. They say, well, Christ fulfilled it. That's why we don't need it, because he fulfilled it. it once again, reading and comprehension is very... Do you understand this, what you, what you read this? What answer would they give? They're, of course, I understand because uh, the Holy Ghost. All right? Here in verse 18 it says, For verily I say to you. Now it's key that we pay attention to the for verily. You got to pay attention to the for verily. For verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, the Torah, Till all is fulfilled. Has all been fulfilled? No, they say they're still waiting on Jesus or waiting on things to happen. So it hasn't all been fulfilled just yet. It says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. You remember when Christ is speaking about John the Baptist? 
He says, even the one who is least is greater than John. This is why we say, you know, put a big question mark to those who call themselves Baptists and pretend themselves to be Christian, you know, when that best they may be just churching. You know, because the, 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 the black folks, our folks, as a large sheep experience with the Baptists has been particularly awful, God awful. You understand? Though a lot of niggas are so whipped that they, you know, they will, they will, they will um, fight against I, you know, fight against me for saying that. For you know, um, the truth may be an offense, but it's not a sin. That's just the truth on that right there. But Christ says, "But whosoever shall do one to do it, then two to teach it, the same shall be called great, great in the kingdom of heaven." great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, and here's the key, here's the real key to overcoming in this time, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, those who write it, and those who sit in the authoritative seats, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven, the Mengista Semayat. Then goes into, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, them from the Kedah, from the Kadmon, you understand, from the Kadmon Adam time, it was said from the olden time, thou should not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now here Christ says in verse 22, but I say to you, now the but doesn't mean that if you kill, you're not in danger of the judgment. What he's seeking to do, what Christ is seeking to do, and this is where it's very important to meditate and to understand this, the testimony of Christ, is saying that if we cut off, the, okay, let me just read this part and then I'll explain. If we cut off the anger, if we cut off that, 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 that anger to our brethren and to those of our spiritual family, but I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now Christ is saying among those who has come to him that you know that if you kill, there's a judgment. But I'm saying that if you are angry, that anger leads to red rum, leads to murder. That anger leads to murder. So he's saying that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. There's a colon there, but we need to take a meditation on this. Think about what he's saying. See, some people say, you know, I was a Christian, but it wasn't really giving me that. So I became a Buddhist, and Buddha told me how to meditate. Because you, fool, fool, you never read, and you never meditate upon what you read, and you never listen to, if you, if you understood and comprehended, says do and teach it. So we must first do, meditate on the fact that if I'm angry with my brother or father, cause, you know what I'm saying? without a cause. Now this does not mean that with, see the cause is not your cause or be cause, but it's something that goes along with his word and not what is best for you to feel better than your brother, but for you to help your brother in the love of God, in the love of God. That's why he said without cause, not without a be cause. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka, or Raka, like Raka, in that day and time was like Menomnete, to say to you, N -n 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 oh, you know, I almost went over it. I almost went totally, totally, um, totally, um, totally past, to totally past this point right here in verse 22. It says that, and let's just go over once again. This is this is what I mean by reading comprehension. It says that whosoever is angry with with who, with who, who is he saying? Whosoever is angry with who, with his, huh, with his brother. Whosoever is angry with his, let's just underline this word right here, with his brother. Now, Balmarinya, you understand? This is when. Them. This is Wendon. Wend, a male of my mother. You understand? A male of Torah. A Torah male. Basically, if you want to get the over, you know, the overstanding to that particular area and theme. So, as we continue to read, verse 22, Matthew 5 and 22, it says, And whoso shall say to his what? Say to his who? Say to his brother. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, 
shall be in danger of the council of the Sanhedrin, of the Shengo, of, of, of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, to who? To who? Who do you think he's saying? Is he saying that we can't use the word fool for really a foolish person? Is he saying that? The fool has said in his heart there is no what? There is no God. But your brother, who's seeking to do the will of our Father, is still your brother, even if he falls short, as long as he's still seeking to do the will of God. Understand that. You might have to excommunicate. You may have to stop the communication. I, 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 can't, I can't talk to you. I, mean, I love you, but I can't talk to you. That's an excommunication. You know, stop, ex, no, no, out of communication. So it says, who shall say, shall say, thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire, or the Gehaname, the Gehaname Issat, the Gehaname Issat. That's what it's saying there. Verse 23 says, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, in other words, this is when a, a temple, Herod's temple was standing. If one went to a temple to bring their gift, like you're bringing your gift to God, right, to the altar, and go thy way. You know what it says? It says if you, if you bring gifts to the altar, and there, excuse me, and there, and there at the altar, you remember it, that thy brother has ought against thee, that your brother has done something against you, that now, you, you, you know, you, you recognize, oh, man. He said, what did he say to do? Leave there thy gift. Leave your gift. Leave your korban. Leave your korban, leave your, um, your, your offering, you know, leave your offering before the altar and go thy way. First be what? First be reconciled with thy what? With thy Roman slave master? With, with Willie Lynch? With slave driver or slave driver's children? No, with thy brother. With thy brother. And then come and offer thy gift. And then you can come and you can offer your gift. It's almost like this we said in the Arastathari. You know, if you're meditating in a meditation and, 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 and you decide to, 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 to burn your chalice, you know what I'm saying? And you decide to hmm, light your split and take a iritical spiritual sacramental lift. And then you remember, oh, man, me and the brethren chant. Why don't you put that down on the side? Put that, stop, break, stop what you're doing. Put it down. Mm. Okay, one more. One more part. Oh, that's some good, that's some good Aishan. Let me go and reconcile my, my Wendy, my brother. That's what he's saying to do. See, this is discipleship. When we talk about discipleship, that's discipline. Because you'd be like, wow, that's some, oh, that's some, that's some iry ishens, you know, that's some good lamb's bread. Ah, oh, I'll burn this after I burn it. I'm well read. Then I'll go in and 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 reason with the, with the brother. No, 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 no. You see, that's not being a disciple. A disciple means that you have to have discipline, because the the first word is order. The first word is order, and and Torah is the first level of the angel of order. The angel of order is the foundation. You see, and as we go far, further, you'll see the connection scripturally and according to the mechanics of the kingdom of heaven. Yes, it's about mechanics. It's about building, right? Being Jason, you know, and instead of a so-called Freemason, be Jason. And it says, and then come and offer thy gift. And then you can come Okay, brethren, yes, I, yeah, you know, pray, pray to I to give our brethren for that. Yeah, man, you know how it goes. All right, and then you can go, and then you can go, okay, yes, Ja. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to head rest with you, Ja. I'm ready to communicate with you, Ja, in and through your word in the name of your son, Gitachinam and Hanitachin Jesus Christus. You see, and then communication, then the lines are clear, then you're in, then your righteousness rating, your righteousness credit. You have credit towards your righteousness because you submitted and humbled yourself to the testimony of the Bain Ha Elohim. You humbled yourself to the testimony of the living Son of God, Yehoshua HaMoshiach. And then 
the herb is a blessing, even for I and I, and the herbal sacrament, and not a curse. See why some mind they get red and they go insane. It's like demons possess them because it's in the wrong order. You understand? It's in the wrong order. We are head resting in the wrong order, and um, that's something we all have to consider and 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 think about. Not that you can smoke herb or whatever like that, but if you're going to call it a sacrament and if you're going to use it. When, uh, especially when you are using it in a sacramental sense, you know, um, so be it. Um, verse 25, let's just get through this if we can. Uh, agree with thine adversary quickly. That adversary among who? Can we agree with the conquering Romans? Is he saying to, to become sellouts to the Romans? To become sellouts to the slave mass, Massa? And the slave drivers? Is he saying that adversary or amongst our keep it in context? The one the Mamach, the one the Mamach in that, the brotherhood, the brother. See, the context for it is brother. The context, and see, we clarify it by Christ's prayer. His last prayer was for us, those who were called out of the world. Ek kalio, ek kalio, ek out of, or ex out of kalio call. And that became ecclesia. You see, that word was coined by the black Hebrews. That was another word in Greek that was coined by the black Hebrews. Just like we coined a lot of words in English, and now they become common words and sayings, so forth and so on. You know, it's very rare that, you know, some of the things that the Europeans and the Anglos coined is really stupid. Some of them don't make sense. You know, but what we do is we'll jigga, jigga, jigga it, and we'll give it some, some soul to it so it really reaches your soul and people get it, even like the bounce and other things. I mean, there's a whole litany of things that we can't really get into that black people, especially we as the Beta Israel, are the creators of because we are the blessing. You know saying? According to Yahweh, we are the blessing. I mean, you can look at black folks, soul music, so forth and so on, but it's like we still are laboring under a curse. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and that curse is the infidelity to our God and King of Kings in and through the name of Jesus Christ, the covenant. It's all about that Kal Kidan. And Christ came to help restore that for us. And the opportunity is still there for us as brothers and sisters. When there's while there's life, where there's life, there's hope. So it says, agree with thine adversary quickly. Agree with your brother or sister that you're you're vexed with or convexed with. Agree with them quickly. Because you, you don't know what today or tomorrow may bring. Agree with them quickly, if possible. If possible, right? Um, quickly, while thou art in the way with him. Notice what it says. While thou art where? Now, some people would say, oh, that means when you're on the road with him, walking down. No, it says while you're in the way of Christ. While we as brethren are in the way together, let us agree. You understand? Let us agree. Let's not hold this anger, these other kind of, because that burns us out in Yahweh, and then we just left up to our own, our own machination. That's what makes the Rastafari become abbreviated, become a Rasta, in other words, and then get subject to a lot of the forces of, of the evil, godless world. So while we're in the way, while thou art in the way with him, least, least, unless at any time, the adversary deliver thee. In other words, the brother snitch on you, the brother turn on you, the brother sell you out. You understand who is your, quote, adversary? Because you had, you know, what people call it hate, you know, like the hater. You're a hater. So let's say like this. Maybe you all get this like this. Agree with thine hater. You always want to say now by hater. When we use hater, we understand who we're talking about. We're not talking about the Ku Klux Klan. You understand when we say hater. You understand, we're not talking about the neo-Nazi fascist, you understand, demon-possessed aliens. We're not talking about that. We're talking about those among our own so-called, quote, people who there's some, some, some nonsense is, is, is existing. Least thine hater deliver thee to the judge. And we're seeing a whole lot of this today. Court TV, uh, all these law shows, people suing people over all kind of stuff, you know, all kind of drama is occurring, and even more so it seems in this time, and the judge delivered thee to the officer, 
just like in, in, it happens in court. The judge would deliver thee to officer, take this man away, and thou be cast into prison. You know what I'm saying? Locked up. One, one will get locked up. So when we think about the high incarceration among black folks, if we were keeping this word of Yeshua HaMoshiach, that incarceration probably would be far down. Crime and violence and, and hatred and murder and infidelity and broken homes and families, deadbeat fathers and, 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 and crazy um, mothers. Because, of, you know, everybody's affected by this. But it's a bigger picture. But we're losing track of the bigger picture, and this is what has us turning on ourselves and has destroyed the black family. You understand? Know the black family and, and the Beta Israel family. The devil knows exactly, the evildoers know exactly what they're doing, and so far it seems as though they've been quite successful with what they're doing. But hopefully their time is short. Verily I say to thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence. You will no way come out from there till thou hast paid the uttermost far thing. Isn't that so correct? Isn't that so true? This is exactly what has happened. That when this has happened to sometimes ones will go to, you remember when ones with the Rockefeller drug laws, ones would go to jail for, one would have a, a, a pound of, of marijuana, it's something less than that. You know what I'm saying? A couple of nickel bags, you know, maybe a couple of ounces on them, right? And they would go to jail like they had killed everybody in the state of Virginia. You know, they would do as much time as, as, as the n n hate crimes, neo-Nazis, uh, Ku Klux Klan, all these. But that's what Christ said. Christ said that would happen. Hmm. Do you ever wonder how he knew? How a black Lord and Savior knew? And it's right here in the Bible. Mm. Verse 27, but, Christ says, but I say to you, but check out what I'm saying to you. Then we skip over, excuse me, we skip over a verse. Verse 27, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, <laughs> this is another case in point that's talking about us as a people. Because most of us marry, and it was a community, families. Families coming together, families living together in the community, so forth and so on. Things like adultery, me sleeping with a man's wife, a uh, man sleeping with my wife. You, can you imagine what kind of social disruption that causes? What kind of pain and ongoing violence that causes for generations? Generational curse. So we didn't pay attention to it then, and I hope and pray we'll pay attention to it now. You know, I was, I was watching, um, what, I think it was Law and Order. On these Law and Order shows, I like that show, you know, somewhat. It helps me to exercise my spiritual mind. Um, and when I was watching that show, I remember I think it was one episode. It might have not been Law and Order, but maybe another kind of show. And it was talking about um, um, when uh, it's firefighters. It was Law and Order with some firefighters, and they were trying to guess. You know, that guy, one guy, was trying to guess. Oh, did you do it? How about you? Oh, you can't. You know, and. The, the firefighter was saying, um, you know, he asked the firefighter, you sure maybe somebody was sleeping with somebody's wife? And the firefighter said, we are a brotherhood. Let me just back out the way for a moment. We are a brotherhood. A wonder my much. Wonder my much. And men's wives are, are, are out of bounds. In other words, one's wives are out of bounds. It might be some chick or whatever like that, but one's wives in that sense are out of bounds. And I made a comment. I made a comment. How interesting that is. Mm -hmm. How interesting that among firefighters and police officers, the real rule among other brotherhoods, such so as firefighters, police officers, some of them are Knights of Columbus, so forth and so on, rah, 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 rah. But amongst them even, the real rules is that wives are out of bounds. We're watching the unit, you know, the unit. On on, on um, that show on TV, the unit, and one of those episodes, you've probably if you if you're watching the unit, you'll know it, that the the commander, the main one, the main commander was 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 cheating, was creeping on one of the one of his officers' wives that he sends on this special unit missions, black ops, um, special forces missions, and everything like that, 
and and um, it finally came out that this guy was sleeping, was was creeping, in other words, with his wife, and then they was out in Afghanistan or Baghdad behind enemy lines, and they was going to resolve it. Now, old military laws and rules, because military is a brotherhood, is basically that if we're part of a military unit, you know, we're a brotherhood, in other words, and a man is sleeping behind next man's back on his wife, that by the brotherhood laws, he's worthy of death. And what's so interesting is this, that even the U.S. military, this is, this is an unspoken rule, but it's a rule all the same. You know, they might try to change it like gays in, in the military and stuff like that, and that's one reason why the whole, the whole Babylonian machine is creeping so hard. But be that as it may, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, 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 a, there's an interesting level of, uh, of fidelity, simple fidelis. You know, there's, there's a level of fidelity even there, tamanyinet, hule tamang. You understand? Even there within those particular orders, whether it's the police, the firefighters, or the military, and we know, and we should all understand, that that's the backbone of this system of things. That's the backbone of this system, because without that, without that, there will be no, quote, law and order. Now, what about our community? What, am, what about amongst I and I? something to really think about, but it's, it helps us to understand the role of real brotherhood. And a lot of those brotherhoods in one way or the other is based on or reflective of this Bible, the military. The original military is based on this, you know, Western, American military, firefighters, Knights of Columbus, uh, uh, police officers, all based on this. And we wonder why when a police officer gets shot or a firefighter uh, dies in the line of duty or something, they all rally around and so forth and so on and close ranks. And, and maybe they don't do it always in the best of situations. But it's still, you know, Christ said it's still something interesting and sweet. You know, it's, it's good that they do this. You know, they have some sense of brotherhood. And Christ said, you can tell my disciples by one condition and one condition only, by how much what they have for one another, how much is love. That's love that they have for one another. Like even among the, these different brotherhoods, if, if one brother is like down on or like, or like in the firefighter thing where some of them couldn't pay their bills and others had rallies, others even gave their own money to help keep the, the family in their home, pay off the mortgage or so forth. Because that was out of the sense of brotherhood. They didn't have to go get a, a UN grant or a loan or, or, or something like that. Some of them might have pride, you know, the pride complex, so forth and so on. But still, the brotherhood was there. And when, when you start to see among them the brotherhood weakening, then you know that whole system is, 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 is untangling, collapsing, and will no longer be able to do what? To serve. To serve and to protect this is what we're supposed to be about as true elect Rastafari, about serving and protecting the King of Kings and his Christ and in and through our black Lord and Savior, Shua HaMoshiach, in word and in deed. In other words, in word and in action. All right, let's, let's continue with the adultery part. So thou should not commit adultery. I think we're familiar with what adultery is. Um, but I say to you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. That's a deep one right there. I, you know, and, and as ones and ones say, it, it may happen. It, it shouldn't happen, of course, in an ideal and perfect situation, but it happens. But even when it happens, we must not lie against the King of Kings and his Christ or against the Word of God. You see, even then, when it happens, that gives us more incentive to be honest in our prayers. You know, not, not, not to go overly bored with the guilt trip on oneself, as a lot of these, these churchins and religious folks and all that pseudoism does, but still it should give us pause for reflection. And, and, and recognize, not try to change it and say, well, you just, I can't just help, I can't help myself. That, that's foolish, you understand? And that moves you out of the brotherhood quick fast because you're lying on our elder brother, on our big brother, on our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. And, you, and that's one thing you don't 
do, because it's about two things, Revelation says, they who keep the commandment of God and the testimony of Jesus Christos Getachem and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's, that right there is what gives them the ability to be overcomers and not to be overcome. And we're in this time where we must be overcomers and not continually get overcome. But we need order and discipline, and we need to begin to hear and to feel the word, you know, and to do it and to teach it. So Christ is seeking now to, 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 to get the motive. It's like in, in law cases. It's a just we know so-and-so did such and such. Or we think he did it, and we have all the evidence on them. But we need to find out uh, 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 what's the motive. What? Why did he do it? You see, Christ already is getting to the motive. You see, and, and, and to what leads to the next level of action that leads to immediate judgment, according to Torah. So he's not, he's not changing Torah. He's not contradicting Torah, but as the greatest Rebbe or Rabbi, he is actually showing how to keep the, well, the, 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 the way of God well. You understand? How to do well doing. You understand? By first getting to the psychological nature, getting to the root nature. So if one starts to think, man, I'd be looking at a lot of women lusting after that woman, I need to discipline myself with that. Still, it'll be there. That's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8. And if you look at Romans chapter 8, he breaks down that wrestling that we go through. It's like our, our mind consents to it, but our flesh, our body is still drawn to this. But Paul, he overcomes that and says, with his mind, he's going to seek to serve the Lord. Because if you focus on your mind serving the Lord, the body still has its desires. But the body cannot do anything unless the mind consents. Understand that. So this is why this is why the true spiritual level of the word is is, is so. I mean, it, it's the greatest psychology in the world because it really works. It really makes people better. You understand? All kind of people. Yeah, even some alien beings. You know, on a level are Christian. I know it sounds kind of wild, but you're gonna find out some stuff about that perhaps. But anyway. He says, and if thy right eye offend thee, like if something you do on the right, then pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Verse 30, and if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So if it's something offensive that you're doing and that, that is weakening your spiritual resolve and causing you to, to, to fall into contradiction to the teaching of our master, then try to cut it off. You understand? But do things in balance, equilibrium. That's what leads to peace. And, and stay pieces of becoming. You understand? Not just a destination, it's a becoming. It's based on those decisions that one makes but to be clear-headed and sober and not to be fanatical and irrational. I understand that. Now, Christ on divorce. And we just want to go through this, and then we'll probably do another part where we'll get into another level of the details of this. But it's important, because we're coming up to the part about turning the other cheek. We have about nine more verses. So it says, It has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of Divorcement, you know, the former one divorced his wife, write down, baby, or woman, uh, I don't like you no more, this is divorce, bye. You know, that's more or less how it was able to be done in um, mosaic times. But I say to you that whosoever shall put away his wife, say divorce his wife, saving, except, in other words, saving means in that context, except for the cause of fornication, except for the cause of fornication. Now, what is fornication? Well, fornication is having sex, one who is not married, having sex you know, with another unmarried person or with a married person. The married person has committed adultery. You understand? The unmarried partner has committed fornication. So we can, you know, if, you, if we get into that strict context of the interpretation, that, that, that um, level of of, of not legality, but law is important. Cause, it, it says, cause of her to commit adultery. 
So unless one does it for the cause of, for, except for the cause of fornication, then you're causing now the woman now to commit adultery. And that's, and that's interesting because a lot of women always say, you know, a lot of different things. Not all women, but the majority. A lot of women, a lot of women, always say that, that, you know, they compare what they're doing to what the man is doing. You know, they say, well, you did such and such, now I'm doing such. So it really shows the headship of the man. In kind of reverse, it kind of still shows that brothers, it's more about us presenting a true and a good example. You understand? Know it's still this way that it's been done, and ones are doing it following, you know, living in the image of the beast. Um, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committed adultery. You know, so whoever shall marry that one that is divorced is committing adultery because still, unless it was for the, except for the cause of fornication, then you are engaged with a woman who is still, according in the eyes of God, in the eyes of Hashem, Baruch Hu, you are engaging in a forbidden, a verboden, a forbidden act. Again, verse 33, ye have heard in the Tabala Semta Chihual, you have heard this. This is all like kind of hearsay for the people that it has been said by them of old time. Like we say back in the days. Back in the days they used to say and back in the days, so this is a back in the days part, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shall perform to Adonai thine oaths. In other words, you're not going to swear by yourself, but instead swear by God. You know, swear by, I swear to God, I, I didn't do it. And usually, you know, a lot of things when people go to that, that point, usually it kind of means, and you, we always get this feeling like, yeah, they, they, they're, they're guilty. Yeah, in fact, when we hear people swearing to God, it's just, it's just a, you know, we like, what are they? You know, like, are they just ignorant? You, don't they know that we know when you say that something is wrong with your statement? I swear to God I didn't do it. I don't know.